I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on uh, on Satmi, on Sami land. Uh, I'm Heather Igloliorti, and our panel this afternoon is Arctic Indigenous Cultural Exchanges and International Context. I'm just coming from another panel where they were, where it was all arts funders talking about this, so it's interesting to be following up with this now. Uh, this panel will explore issues of commonality between Indigenous artists from the Arctic. Artists will discuss their personal experiences collaborating with other Indigenous artists in an international context or uh, in some cases in national contexts. How our shared histories of colonialism... Oh, this is the text that was like translated from English to Norwegian and then back to English. <laughs> I won't read it because it's gibberish, basically. Um, <laughs> what I will say is that in Canada... Uh, up until very recently, our previous funding structures have prevented us from really doing, uh, even within the four Inuit regions and the other uh, Arctic uh, and subarctic regions of Canada, we do not, we have not up to till now had good funding structures that allow us to collaborate together. Uh, the Canadian Arctic is the most expensive place in the world to travel to. Pond Inlet uh, tickets can be between thirty-five and five thousand uh, dollars for a, just to go to another place in the Arctic, let alone to get south. Uh, for me to go home to Nunatsiavut, flights are if I book early enough, it's you know starts around eleven hundred dollars, and that's a two-hour flight. Uh, you know, you have to you have to make more than one trip, but as the crow flies, it's not even that far away, and they can be up to twenty five hundred dollars, and that's and that's in the subarctic, like it's fairly south. So, Iqaluit, which is the major center, uh, flights are you know one thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, depending on when you book. So it's extremely expensive to do collaborations, even within our own Arctic, to get people out of our Arctic and into other parts of the Arctic is also extremely expensive, and we've been really limited in our ability to do international projects as well because of, uh, because of the great geographic distance, but also because our funding structures had previously not been set up for this way. Uh, we're very fortunate now to be facing a new strategic plan from the Canada Council for the Arts, and we look forward to a, a, the capacity building and the ability to work more openly and more collaboratively with our neighbours all around the circumpolar world. Um, I am just going to briefly talk about, I'm not even going to really talk about it, I'm just going to uh, very quickly go through a project that I recently did just in October called Inuit Blanche. I would like, I would like applause for the title. <laughs> 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 and this is uh, a project that myself and my colleagues, Dr. Mark Turner and Britt Galpin, who's the editor of Inuit Art Quarterly, uh, we did a, we put together this one night arts festival uh, with a circumpolar focus. Of course, it was very Canadian because that's what our funding allowed, but we did have um, an Alaskan native, um, we had an Anubiad, um, Anubiad? A Lutic woman, uh, Tanya Luke and Linklater. We had Yuar Nango, who is Sami, and we had uh, Yeni Leiti, who is Greenlandic, perform and participate as well. So there was uh, outdoor music. This was all over the city of St. John's. It was during the Inuit Studies Conference. We had Arctic food, uh, live sketching of uh, Kamatik, and then people could bring their own dog in and get like a pet portrait done <laughs> with the Kamatik <laughs> while talking about the history of the dog slaughter in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, there was phot photographic exhibitions of country food as well as uh, contemporary country food. This is uh, Char with Fish Row. Uh, live uh, printmaking demonstrations that were available to youth. Uh, Yeni Lady's piece, uh, Take a Stone in Your Hand, which was a, a long distance piece that she had sent um, with a poem that was a takeaway. Uh, live carving demonstrations, contemporary e uh, sealskin clothing, um, which was not actually for sale, but which was set up in a local shop alongside other contemporary Inuit clothing in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, Tanya Lucan Linklater's dance performance outside. Uh, traditional sealskin sewing demonstrations that took place in a sealskin shop. As you can see, there's uh, commercial boots as well as um, traditionally tanned sealskin. A collaborative throat singing exchange that uh, brought together six Inuit from across the Canadian Arctic. Uh, installation by Cousine Van Huvelen, who's an artist now living in urban, um, Inuit artist living in an urban setting. Uh, Marjorie Tabone, also of Alaska, doing a neon kakanit project. She actually did my tattoos uh, that same weekend. Uh, a performance venue featuring our very own <laughs> Lakalu and uh, Vinnie Karatek, Karatek? of uh, uh, Hegevut. And then it ended with a concert with multiple uh, Inuit groups coming all over as well. That project was only possible because we were also doing it during the conference and so many of the people coming in were also uh, being brought in to speak at the conference. If we had just, we had a very small budget, we did this on like $50,000 or $60,000. Uh, 
Um, but the total amount that it would have cost if we'd paid for everything would have been in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we're just fortunate that so many people were coming in already for the conference. And so that's the kind of situation um, that we were in, in being able to put together something like this, which was a one night only kind of a festival. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce the rest of the members of the panel and I'll ask our tech to come up and set up for the following person. I think we've got video coming up next. Uh, our panel is uh, Lakalu Williamson Bathory, Michelle Olson of the Raven Spirit Dance, and Anne Leila Utsi <laughs> of uh, the International Sami Film Institute. Each of these, uh, each of the women on the, our panel today, are artists in their own right, as well as here working with organizations. And so I think that you'll both speak to your individual practices as well as your collective work. And we look forward to having a, a brief conversation <laughs> about um, some of the challenges that exist in trying to work um, across the Arctic, and then also what our uh, hopes and dreams may be for the future, looking at uh, you know, the outcomes of, a, of an event like this where we have um, international cooperation on the agenda. All right, thank you. Luckily. Uh, yes, yeah, so I am a, a Greenland Canadian based in Iqaluit, Nunavut, which is the, on Baffin Island, uh, the big island next to Greenland. Uh, and uh, most of my work is based on Uayil uh, Greenlandic map, oh, yes, the microphone. Um, is the is Greenlandic mass dancing, and I'm going to be showing you an example of uh, what I do through mass dancing. Um, I do it as a as a performance full on, but I also take it as a as a source of inspiration for my writing with my collaborative um, relationships with other artists, as well as um, other different types of um, uh, theatrical artwork and provocations. I also work as a, um, a person in a non-profit society that I helped found about eight years ago called Kagyavud, and it's uh, to support performing artists in Nunavut. Um, Nunavut is the only circumpolar region uh, that does not have a performing arts center. So all of the artwork, uh, the performing artwork that we do in Nunavut is made in, in living rooms, in school gyms, in uh, inadequate spaces. And yet the things that come out of Nunavut are so uh, intrinsic to our identity that uh, in many instances it's quite uh, uh, mind-blowing to, to see what's being done. Mm. Um, so I'm going to keep on keeping it short, just like you. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess I'll show you with a film uh, that I worked on. Uh, it's, um, it's a part of an exhibition right now called Hashtag Call Response. Uh, and it's uh, a collaboration with um, five or six other Indigenous women. And the whole idea is that Indigenous women are such sources of uh, strength and resilience in, in the uh, time of colonization. And it's about us asking our audiences for a response, but also being able to give to our communities. So I'll show it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good choice. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Ooh, that did a lot. <laughs> did that help? <laughs> Maybe. There we go. Is <laughs>
<laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's a, an example of the kind of work that I do. We are so stereotyped as uh, as indigenous people and as Inuit and as women, and uh, it is so important to be able to physically peel off all of those layers, so that I can dare each one of you to look <laughs> and appreciate what it means to be of the land. So uh, I'll pass it on. Thank you. Um, yes, um, my name is Anne Laila Utsi, and now I'm the director of the Sami Film Institute. Uh, I have a background as a filmmaker from the film school in Lillehammer. And I remember when I um, finished there, I had uh, a documentary idea I wanted to make. It was, I have been living in the Amazon in my young and crazy days. And <laughs> I wanted to go back and do a documentary about indigenous spirituality. Uh, and there in the Amazon jungle, um, there were, were a lot of uh, Norwegian missionaries. And I was always wondering why are they there and what do <laughs> business do they have to be there for? So um, me and my producer, who was my father, <laughs> Um, we w were attending this pitching session for Norwegian funders at the Norwegian Film Institute and um, I did this pitch and and then my father he ended our pitch and he said yes with this film we want to shoot a poison arrow directly into the heart of the Norwegian mission <laughs> in the Amazon <laughs> so it was very silent in this room <laughs> and nobody said a word and of course we didn't get any money <laughs> to make this film so uh, what we did we went home and we said well we need our own film institute and that's what we did we have established uh, our own film institute and this is what we need we need the institutions of power in our own hands we need the independence we have been fighting very hard to, to be independent, both in the Nordic uh, sense, because Sami filmmakers are in all the Nordic countries, but also to have the possibility to collaborate with other indigenous filmmakers. For example, Zacharias Kunak and Nunavut's mm. film environment has been such a great inspiration for us and the work we are doing here in Sami. And uh, we are continuing this, and we have done this Arctic Film Circle collaboration with nine indigenous filmmakers from the whole Arctic, from Alaska, Greenland, Nunavut, uh, Yakutsk in Russia, and in Sakmi. So uh, five short films will come out of that. Mm. And this project um, is a very good example of, of the power of the collaboration and the cultural exchange, because when we... When we can sit together and go directly into the subject without having to explain uh, everything, then fantastic things can happen. And this is where, where our, our po possibilities are. And the, the, if we are talking about colonialism today, the colonialism is in the system, in the bureaucracy. This is where we are still colonized because indigenous arts, indigenous theater, indigenous film, music, it can never be as important as the majority when it comes to funding. Mm. So this is where we have to change the whole mindset of, um, of the majority uh, system and that is a very very big task but we have to start there and we have to build our own independent institutions and take the power and and fight for our independence and that's where the uh, amazing uh, projects will will come from so yeah <laughs> um can i get you to put the just maybe one of those images and then um the other one my name is michelle olson i'm from the trondek which in first nation um which is dawson city yukon and I, um, I live in Vancouver. I'm the artistic director of Raven Spirit Dance. So I create dance, I talk dance, 
I am dance, <laughs> all those things. <clears throat> I just wanted to share a couple images of, again, it's, the, it's very similar to the land. This is my body. This is my father at the top of the world highway, and this is a piece, uh, Frost, Exploding Trees, Moon, a solo. And the idea of how the um, expansiveness of space and land is inside of us and inside of our work. And that's my daughter at the head of my cousin's uh, fish fish boat on the Yukon River. And this piece is a Kluktega Nashe, which is Salmon Girl Dreaming. And that's in my community in uh, Dawson City, the Dano Jazo Cultural Center. And the, um, as I was starting to create my own work, lo and behold, my First Nation was building a theater. <laughs> <laughs> so as when uh, the Dano Jazo Cultural Center opened, uh, it would be two years later I started creating work for that space. It's a 90-seat theater, very small stage, but I managed. And uh, it really is the heart of the work that I've done. And it's um, there's pieces that I've created on that stage that I've taken across Canada. Um, I kind of want to, this idea of collaboration and talking about collaboration um, and why it's so important, and I think almost essential across um, the Indigenous communities. Um, because there's a lot of, so the words that I've been hearing um, the last couple days are, uh, and someone mentioned it this morning on the panel, that we're resources, mm. um, uh, economic arguments. Um, and I think that in, in a way, sure, we should, like we could have that conversation, but do we always have to have that conversation? And it, do we always frame it that way? Because when we talk about resources, resources, we talk about consumption. When we talk about consumption, inherently the status quo is is like knit right into that and colonialism. So if we talk about you know our culture as a resource or ourselves as resources, that means that we can be consumed. And I think um, like we, to flip it, like when. Um, when you come to see a piece of work, a performance, ideally you pay for a ticket to go and see something and you consume it, right? It's a, it's a transaction. And when I've um, worked with, uh, I have an elder and a very close friend who's West Coast, a Squamish First Nation, Bob Baker, Sopaluk, and he talks about witnessing. So that's the flip of it, that we witness. You come into the space to witness the moment and that event does not happen until it's witnessed. So that changes the whole sacredness of our being together in the room and doing the work in the room. And I think also too it shifts uh, when we are able to, so that's a shift in worldview, right? You walk into a theater space and you shift your world, world view, then you shift the way you're able to receive and give and talk about things and make decisions about things. Um, I, it was really interesting. I had this conversation with some storytellers, and we were talking about how worldview um, changes where you put the periods and changes where you put the commas. And it, it can mean all the difference, especially I'm sure writers in the room know that, like where you decide to have a full stop and where you decide to kind of glide over the, the thought or the image. Um, so the idea of, uh, in the script for today, was shared histories of colonialism and resistance, that that's what the collaboration, um, that's why we collaborate. And I think potentially, sure, <laughs> but I think once you get into, uh, it's about creating safe space with each other. And, and you mentioned that you don't have to, like when you get in a room with other indigenous artists, you don't have to explain yourself the way you normally have to explain yourself if you're not, if you're in a different kind of space. And so for me, collaboration is so important around um, creating self-determined space. And from that self-determined space, there's a safe place, um, a safe space to actually do the work um, and continue to do the work um, there, you know, there's certain things that we've done in our, like working across Canada, where 
we um, sing ourselves in in a rehearsal process so we the song is our transition into the work and we sing ourselves out and so we are able to leave the outside world to come in leave the uh, rehearsal world to come out we feast our um, ancestors so a lot of uh, projects we have to make sure that we have a day where we um, have a lunch and we share food but we also have a spirit plate and that plate is put out into nature and there's these things that are kind of underpinnings of practice that I think can really shift a lot of things um, I, I'm working on a it's called confluence um, and it's with a group of women um, from all different nations across Canada and it's about just getting into the space and that confluence where two rivers meet, right? And how these different rivers meet and turn into this larger body of moving water. And uh, in that process, we've been talking a lot about um, um, and moving together and creating the space to collaborate. There are lots of tears. I find when you first <laughs> always cry. We always know <laughs> the first two days will probably be cry just because just it takes so, it's so hard to get to that space. You work so hard to get there. Um, but I would, I would like to share with you just the first two minutes that I have a longer uh, clip. It's a 20 minute video about our process, and I can give you the a YouTube address um, after. But uh, yeah, if you can just press play and we'll just, this is how we open. Oh, thanks. I got it. And we can stop it there. Yeah. Thank you. It has become a practice within Raven Spirit Dance. Yeah, so that's how we start um, our work together in that collaboration. So I wanted to share that. Thank you. All right, we actually have a whole 10 minutes that we can engage in a conversation together. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to open it up to the floor. I will repeat, we're recording. I, I know we're not amplified, but we are recording for the video. So I will repeat back questions. And please remember to pick up the mic as you answer. Uh, does anybody have questions or comments, experiences of your own that fit in with what we're talking about? <coughs> Come on, guys. It's like the first question period. <laughs> Everyone's like, I didn't know there would be a quiz. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Mix 
the question is uh, if, if Luckily considers her work performing or visual or uh, some kind of a mix? Um, yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, I've had poetry in a gallery in, as a part of an exhibition. I do live performance. I do video work that becomes visual art. Uh, so, and I, I do collaborative theater where we each create pieces of something that we do together. So my artwork isn't necessarily one thing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, she said it's fabulous. <laughs> uh, yes. I think there is um, it's a difficult uh, term in our times when we talk about culture industries and all these uh, mm. crazy mm. terms uh, which are um, difficult to use in a, in a serious sense um, but there is a difference if you buy a ticket to end the theatre and you watch a film or you have the physicality of the body on the scene because this is something you cannot consume safe space for the performer on stage. And it's also the question of repeatness, because the film you can watch twice, three times, it will always be the same, the film is everything can be done. But the performance, it will change, and you know, it will change every day, it will change every second. And the moment you do your thing, it's gone, and it will come back in a, in a quite different form the next day. So I think there are, we don't have, we shouldn't be so much afraid of consume when it comes to the physicality of Um, I just wanted to um, present uh, one of the directors of the Arctic Film Circle. She's here, Anna Hoover. Um, could you, Anna, say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> just a few, just a few words about the, um, the collaboration of the Arctic Film Circle and how how you experienced that. Will you bring her the microphone? Yes, please. I don't want to stand with my back to anybody. Um, so yes, I was um, I had the joy and honor of being part of the Arctic Film Circle, and um, it came with challenges. Uh, there were nine of us, and um, we came from all different parts of the the north, and uh, we had to agree upon one story that uh, we were all comfortable with um, adapting to our region. And um, we we didn't have much time to sort of, we didn't have like a week to just get to know each other, you know. Um, we had three days and they were very long days and uh, 12, 14 hours. Some of us were jet lagged and um, so we um, started by sort of comparing things that we all had in common, um, which are many, obviously. <laughs> um, our relationship to the land and uh, challenges with travel and expenses with uh, living and food and things and um, and then we uh, just tried to um, think of what kind of story we wanted to tell and uh, it became a story about two women, two sisters and um, it's it's fabulous to see the finished films and to see the story adapted to the different landscape and the different uh, cultural dress and architecture and um, and then the, of course the people in all the different areas. Um, the stories are quite different, uh, but but they're all you know obviously um, started at the same framework. Um, so it 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 was lovely, and I I think it's a nice um, example of a way to collaborate. Um, among different countries. Thank you. 
Other comments or questions for our collective? Katya? We had a lot of political talk yesterday. It's not so loud. You have to speak up. We, we had a lot of political, um, we listened to a lot of political speeches yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I also asked myself the question, what is the goal of this summit? But when you talk about Arctic collaborations, do you think that is also a way to balance so many of that political discussion that happened yesterday? It's a great question. Yeah, it's a wonderful question because I truly believe that collaboration amongst indigenous people is a decolonizing process. Uh, to have people who are raising their children, that who are um, hunting, who are thinking creative things, come together and talk and create is so vitally important because well, in Inuit regions, we have uh, so many different colonial gazes. Uh, there's the gaze towards Denmark from Greenland, the to gaze towards Ottawa in, in northern Canada, uh, and uh, to the States in Alaska. But when we are able actually to connect, to spend time talking and conversing and creating something together, that gaze gets snipped away for a while, and we actually see each other as people that are creating culture. So uh, as, as important as polit politics are, I have a political science background, uh, the conversations taking place between real people is what is vitally important. Yeah, um, just a small comment on that also, because uh, like we, we have been building uh, our own institution and what we have seen that has been really, really important is that it goes hand in hand, the building of the, of the institution and taking the power there with the creativity. For example, in the Sami film industry, uh, we have now a very successful Sami feature film, the first uh, feature film of the new generation, uh, Amanda Kernel and Sami Blood, which is about the colonial history in, in Sweden and this Sami girl running away from herself and, and her Sami background. So it's, it's really important that this, it goes hand in hand, the, the dialogue with the politicians and the, and the funding, but we also, the, the talents and the, and the creative forces, that's where where uh, the power is. Yeah. yeah. Um, it kind of reminds me a little bit of what you were saying yesterday about uh, Prime Minister Trudeau giving the building. Over. Oh, yeah, yeah. The so that, building, yeah, yeah, so this idea of um, it's like the the impulse that happens in the room when you the gaze is gone or that it you can really feel the connection like that impulse turns into a sequence which turns into a structure which mm -hmm. turns into the infrastructure and i think part of the whole frustration sometimes is that infrastructure is laid upon this and and can stifle what mm -hmm. what um the actual um trajectory that this kind of work can take us and how it needs to be supported. Do you want to talk about just that, about the building? We had that conversation. What was I saying about the building? Well, you just said, <laughs> well, it was the old U.S. It's, it's the old American embassy. Embassy. It's like very colonial architecture. Yeah. And it faces. But, the, but I mean, the, the, the agency in it is that it is the building that directly faces our parliament. So, so that's interesting. But the yeah. building itself, like, it's going to be given to... To indigenous stuff, I don't know. Indigenous it's pretty people. vague so far. <laughs> but what it will be? They just said it's like it was just an announcement yesterday because it was National uh, Aboriginal Peoples Day, which our Prime Minister did change to Indigenous Peoples Day, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, and he made the announcement that it was going to be an Indigenous space, but we don't know what that means yet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so, but and I think that's also that's interesting because that's going to pose a lot of problems because, yeah, um, ideologically and philosoph philosophically it's probably built on a lot of different ways of seeing the world. Yeah. Uh this question? <laughs> Okay. 
So I was just going to say that the Inuit Circumpolar Conference represents all our northern nations, and um, you know we all have a seat at that table. I do know that they have some artistic component, but they are a political machine. Um, and I wonder if there's some way that we can, you know, work with them. And I know that Ukalik, is that her name? She's, she's not in here right now, but um, the chair of ICC is at this meeting, and she did speak briefly yesterday, or was on the panel yesterday. But um, I think that's one way to try to, you know, I think after we leave this place, we should, I'm not on Facebook, but we should figure out some way to, you know, be connected and create, uh, you know, this keep this conversation going. So that's just an aside. Yeah, you know, like it's a very, it's a very Western style. Of, I have a microphone. Um, it's a very Western <laughs> style. I've got, I've got this this thing um, of uh, of you know classification to keep uh, political structures separate from educational stru structures, separate from arts institutions, and um, you know I think that the that hopefully in the future the ICC and other organizations like this will take more of an indigenous approach, which is a holistic approach to understanding how uh, culture and language uh, is our politics, is deeply embedded in our structures and should be a part of our legal processes, and it's a, a part of all of that together. And so I think that um, I'm, I'm very grateful that there is such a, a this strong and sort of equally weighted, you know, one political day, one arts day in this conference, because I've certainly attended lots of things where the arts are the window dressing for the political or like the mining <laughs> interests or what have you and so I think it's it's good that we have this amazing group of scholars and curators and artists together who are talking about this critically because I do feel that uh, I, I can already feel that there are connections coming forward that are going to proliferate um, you know with it or independently from these uh, the political spheres that brought us together Uh, any last questions, or are we at the end, ready for coffee and tea? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nakumi, thank you, everyone. Yay. This is great. Yay.